Good morning. Uh, my name is Barbara Johnson, a Minneapolis City Council President, and I'm joined by my colleague, Elizabeth Glidden, who is the Council Vice President. Um, we have the pleasure this morning before Committee of the Whole uh, to recognize a group of dignitaries visiting our city uh, from our sister city tour France. And um, this is the 25th anniversary of our sister city relationship with tour. And so our guests have been with us since uh, Saturday, uh, been to a twins game, uh, toured our 311 center, uh, been over to the Minnesota History Center, I've been up to Victory Memorial Drive, lots and lots of places in our city, and um, I think they're probably tired, <laughs> but uh, uh, we uh, had a beautiful time, I think, to welcome them um, to our city. It's a great uh, economic boom that we're going through, and so um, we always value our sister city relationships, and when we can talk to people from across the world, we understand that our a lot of our problems and concerns are the same all over, and we learn from each other how we deal with them. So I'd like to ask uh, the tour uh, group to come up to the front here, please. And um, we have a translator, uh, Jerome, uh, and he can, he can help us. So maybe just my introduction to the group. Why don't you stand next to me? Okay. All right. Very good. Donc, je m'appelle Barbara Johnson, je suis présidente du euh, conseil municipal et je suis accompagnée de ma collègue, la vice-présidente du conseil municipal, Elisabeth Gleder. Et euh, la délégation, je, veux, je pense que ce n'est pas la peine que je traduise tout ce que vous avez fait. On va procéder donc avec le, la cérémonie. Oh, okay. Je suis Jérôme Chateau, je suis Jérôme Chateau, vice-président de la French American Chamber of Commerce et je suis l'interpréteur pour vous aujourd'hui. I am Serge Babari, Mayor of Tours. I'm Jacques Shevchenko, first Deputy Mayor. I'm Miriam Le Suef, Deputy Mayor in charge of Parks and Gardens. I'm Jerome Tibaldi, Deputy Mayor in charge of the international relations of the city and the culture. We have a, a resolution uh, of the mayor and city council uh, that we would like to present uh, to our sister city tour. And so uh, it is celebrating the 25th anniversary of the sister city friendship between the city of Tours and the city of Minneapolis. And it says, whereas the city of Tours and the city of Minneapolis have enjoyed a sister city relationship for 25 years, which was first formed in the year 1991, a relationship which seeks to enhance global cooperation at the municipal level, promote cultural awareness and understanding, to stimulate economic development, and to support exchanges and cooperation in the areas of business, culture, tourism, as well as education, sports, urban planning, and technology. And um, Jerome, I think I'll read this, and then we'll um, kind of uh, synthesize it so we don't have to read it all. Sure. Uh, an official delegation of the City of Tours Tour will be visiting Minneapolis uh, from July 16 to the 21st to participate in the Minneapolis Sister Cities Day, professional study visits, meetings and events celebrating the 25th anniversary, as well as the 2016 Aquitennial Center Point Torchlight Parade this evening. So our guests will be joining us at the parade. The tour delegation represents, um, includes representatives from the Foie de Tour, a regional event in, in tour which will feature the United States, Minnesota, and Minneapolis in 2017, next May. And Sister Cities International is a nonprofit organization that builds and supports citizen diplomacy networks across the world, promoting peace through mutual respect understanding and cooperation, one individual, one community at a time. And these honorable goals underscore the relationship and the mutual admiration between the city of Tours and Minneapolis. And Tours has contributed greatly to the vitality of Minneapolis through gifts of artwork, sharing of information, and as a constant support as a global partner. So therefore, be it resolved that we welcome the, the delegation and uh, wish them uh, a great visit and uh, send our esteem and goodwill. Thank you. Okay, so you can maybe just synthesize that. Okay. <laughs> it's your usual, the usual. Yep. Donc, 
C'est une résolution du maire et du conseil municipal de la ville de Minneapolis pour célébrer le 25e anniversaire des relations des villes jumelées de Tours et de Minneapolis. La ville de Tours et la ville de Minneapolis entretiennent depuis 25 ans une relation de ville jumelle, commencée en 1991. Des relations qui ont pour but de promouvoir la coopération globale au niveau municipal, d'encourager les échanges culturels et la compréhension mutuelle de stimuler le développement économique et de promouvoir les échanges et la coopération dans le domaine des affaires, de la culture, du tourisme, ainsi que de l'éducation, du sport, du planning urbain et de la technologie. Une délégation officielle de la ville de Tours rendra visite à Minneapolis, en visite à Minneapolis, les 16, du 16 au 21 juillet 2016 pour participer à la célébration des villes jumelées de Minneapolis pour faire des échanges professionnels, des rencontres et participer à des événements qui célèbrent le 25e anniversaire du jumelage des villes de Tours et Minneapolis et leur longue amitié, ainsi qu'une participation au défilé aux torches au festival d'Aquatennial. La délégation de Tours inclut des représentants de la Foire de Tours, un événement régional à Tours important qui accueillera les états unis le Minnesota et Minneapolis en 2017. Les Villes Jumelées Internationales est une organisation non gouvernementale qui soutient et fait la promotion des échanges entre citoyens par différents réseaux dans le monde entier afin de promouvoir la paix, le respect mutuel, la compréhension et la coopération. Une personne, une communauté à la fois. Et ces buts importants soulignent l'importance de la relation et de l'admiration mutuelle entre les villes de Tours et Minneapolis. Tours a grandement contribué à la vitalité de Minneapolis par ses cadeaux d'art et son partage d'informations et son soutien constant en tant que partenaire fidèle. Thank you. Right. So we'll present us to Mayor Barbary. Mayor. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank tout votre conseil pour euh, ce texte de résolution à l'occasion du 25e anniversaire. Les élus de Tours euh, ont mis leur écharpe d'élus pour marquer la solennité de cet instant qui nous engage sur les termes de la résolution. I want to thank uh, you, Barbara Johnson, President of the City Council, and all of you members of the Minneapolis City Council for this great occasion and this great honor that you're doing to uh, ask the city of Tours. And in this very solemn occasion, as you notice, we are wearing the uh, traditional French mayor's outfits. Merci aux membres du conseil et aux habitants de Minneapolis de leur amitié avec la ville de Tours et, vous le savez, vos amis français. C'est une grande journée pour euh, l'amitié entre Minneapolis et Tours. Et euh, soyez certains que nous serons dignes euh, des résolutions que vous avez bien voulu euh, nous présenter. Merci à tous. Thank you. Thank you to everyone, citizens of Minneapolis, elected officials. You can rest assured of our continuous friendship and a strong will to cooperate and deepen our relationship and honor those beautiful words that you've uh, bestowed on us today. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, I am now calling to order the more official uh, portion of our Committee of the Whole agenda. My, uh, of our Committee of the Whole, excuse me, this is our regularly scheduled meeting of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Elizabeth Glidden, and I am the uh, chair of this committee. And we are joined today by Council Members Gordon, Kano, Reich, Bender, Council President Johnson, Council Member Andrew Johnson, uh, Yang, Quincy, Orsami, uh, Goodman, Fry, and Palmasano. And we are uh, full quorum of this committee. Um, our next agenda item uh, following the presentation that uh, we just uh, participated in is a public hearing and uh, this is regarding the proposed charter amendment regarding classified service eligibility register and I believe we were going to have an overview of this amendment and then open the public hearing am I correct Ms. Ferguson? Okay. Come forward whoever is going to present for us and then we will open the public hearing. Good, uh, good morning, Chair Glidden and members of the Committee of the Whole. My name is Patience Ferguson. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for the City of Minneapolis. So today I'll just be giving a brief overview of the Rule of Three. So what is the rule of three? It refers to the number of candidates that can be certified to a hiring manager for consideration. Under the rule of three, applicants for civil service positions are scored based on the qualifications and the candidates with the highest scores are then certified to the hiring manager for consideration. A candidate below the top three score and applicants may not be selected for the position. Just a little background information with regard to the Rule of Three. Uh, the Rule of Three was this for the city of Minneapolis was created before human resources was a profession. There was an assumption at the time that one may test for all attributes and characteristics that may be desirable in a candidate. It may favor candidates that test well. Um, however, it also does not take into consideration sound human resource principles and practices. A little bit more history with regard to the Rule of Three. The Minneapolis City Charter originally provided for the Rule of One. And the legislature, the Minnesota legislature, passed a special law in 1978 applicable only to the City of Minneapolis. The Plain Language Charter approved, for 2000 and, approved in 2013 provides for the Rule of Three. Regarding the amending of the city charter, the Minnesota Constitution provides that any special law may be modified or superseded by a later home rule charter or amendment applicable to the same local government unit. The city charter may be amended by 13-0 vote of the city council. The proposed charter amendment removes the rule of three language from the charter and grants the council and the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board the authority to adopt an ordinance regarding hiring procedures. Why the change we believe is needed is, the first reason is because it supports the city goals and values regarding one Minneapolis, a city that works in equity, creating fair and just opportunities and outcomes for all. Number two is around hiring and selection. Having the flexibility to interview a sufficient number of qualified candidates increases our ability to build a highly qualified and talented workforce that reflects our community. And number three, increasing competition for top talent. What you see in front of you is just an overview of how this process works on a day-to-day -day basis. And as you can see, sometimes the um, percentages or the numbers are very close but because of where our existing practices are, we could only, the hiring manager can only interview the top three candidates. Some things that also I think should be taken into consideration as we look into hiring selection is this is a current overview of what our, our current selection hiring and principles and practices are. We review the job, we have an, applic um, an objective rating of application materials, additional testing, we create a list, we select and train the interview panels. 
We conduct standard structured interview uh, interviews, and we also do reference and pre-employment checks. We've also added some additional safeguards. We have an ethics ordinance uh, to promote fair practices. We have a city of Minneapolis nepotism policy that has been in place for quite a while. We also have a revised city of Minneapolis civil service appeals process. And we also have discrimination, harassment and retaliation protections, including an HR investigations unit, the Minneapolis Department of Civil Rights, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and also the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ferguson, very much for that overview. Um, just for my colleagues, I'm getting into speaker management now, but we have had this presentation or a similar presentation before, and I'm not seeing any informational questions. So with that, we will go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, I know we have uh, one person uh, signed up, but I know a couple others that may be here as well to testify. So uh, Ms. Rubenstein, if you want to come forward and then we'll take others who are here to testify. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is Andrea Rubenstein and I reside at 5108 Bryant Avenue South in Minneapolis. I'm here today to speak in support of the proposed charter change to eliminate the rule of three. I have two particular interests in this matter. First, I'm a member of the Minneapolis Charter Commission and had an opportunity to participate in the presentation and discussion of this matter at our May 4, 21, 2016 meeting, during which we voted our approval of the charter change. In addition, I'm a retired attorney and had a long practice in employment law, and during that time became quite familiar with the operations and procedures of the civil service system in this city, including the rule of three. Over the years, I've had ample opportunity to think about and observe the impact of this rule. I support the elimination of the rule of three wholeheartedly because first, the change does not affect in any way the civil service testing and qualifications process. The purpose behind the testing system, as I have always understood it, is to find the most qualified people for promotional or entry level positions. No one ends up on an eligibility list who is not qualified. And the elimination of the rule of three doesn't change this. In fact, it gives the hiring managers more leeway to select the most qualified people. In terms of equal, oppor equal employment opportunity, the rule of three unduly restricts opportunity. Its elimination opens up the selection process in a way that promotes fairness and equity, and perhaps just as important, the sense of fairness and equity that's important to morale of employees. As I understand from the testimony at the, our Charter Commission uh, meeting, some of which we have heard this morning now, the city has been an outlier. The rule of three does not meet best practice standards anymore and is no longer a common practice around the country. In other words, it's kind of an outdated embarrassment. And finally, the reason it doesn't uh, represent best practices, life experience, cultural competence, and the like cannot be easily tested. While we wanna make sure that all applicants have the required qualifications, for a given position, and that determination will clearly continue to be incorporated in the civil service process, elimination of the rule of three will eliminate the arbitrary screening out of fully qualified persons, sometimes whose scores are only a fraction of a point less than the, than the top three. Instead, it will allow for consideration of other important, if less tangible, attributes in accord with the human resources standards. The plan language charter had retained the rule of three because at that time as we were going through that process, our goal was to streamline the charter 
and not make any substantive change. Now that we have the plain language charter, we can look at it much more in depth because it's organized so much better and we can determine necessary policy changes. The Charter Commission members are a pretty diverse group in outlook and we rarely agree to any change without real vigorous debate, to put it mildly. Um, but this proposal made so much sense to all of us that not only did we easily approve it, we were compelled to offer our thanks and our compliments to the human resources professionals who had made a presentation to us about the reasons for the elimination of the rule of three. I again thank them and also thank Council Member Glidden for raising this important issue and urge the Council's unanimous approval of the charter change. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubenstein. Anybody else who would like to come forward? Chief Tyner. <coughs> All right, uh, Chair, members of the committee, thank you for hearing me on this uh, issue today. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of the fire department. Uh, I am Assistant Chief Brian Tyner. I'm the Assistant Chief of Administration uh, for the fire department. And then also uh, Charles Rucker, the uh, president of the Minneapolis African American Professional Firefighters Association will not be able to be here today. So he has given me permission to represent them also. Uh, the fire department and the uh, Minneapolis African American Professional Firefighters Association is speaking in favor of this uh, charter amendment to remove the uh, rule of three for the following reasons. Uh, first of all, studies have shown that the rule of three is to be ineffective. Um, back in December of 1995, the, uh, remember what this, uh, Commission was called. It's called the uh, U.S. Merit Systems Protection Board uh, conducted a report to the President and the Congress of the United States uh, called the Rule of Three in Federal Hiring, Boone or Bain. And in that report back in December of 1995, they found that first that the uh, Rule of Three was derived from the Civil Service Reform Act of 1978. It was then, as uh, patients mentioned, adopted by the state and later the city. <clears throat> The findings of that report were, I quote, as a curb on the number of candidates referred to managers, it does not represent good hiring policy. Further, given the variations in ability to predict future job performance exhibited by the different federal examining processes, a single legislated referral and selection process does not seem reasonable. They also found that the rule of three does not represent the best way to foster merit-based hiring. And lastly, they found that interaction between the rule of three and the current approach to veterans preference too often produces results that are not in the best interests of managers or job candidates, including candidates with veterans preference. Fast forward to May 2010 and uh, the uh, president uh, decided to act on some of the recommendations in the 1995 report. Uh, the president, uh, made a reform initiative called the President's Hiring Reform Initiative called Category Rating. It was issued by the President uh, where he incorporated reform ideas recommended in the 1995 report. And in that uh, initiative, he got rid of the rule of three in federal hiring and replaced it with category rating by which the names of all eligible candidates in the highest quality category are referred to the certificate of eligibles to be selected uh, to be to the selecting official for consideration. Common categories are highly qualified, well qualified, and qualified. So as uh, the last speaker uh, attested to, uh, no unqualified candidates ever actually make a hiring list. Um, secondly, uh, as has been already mentioned, the fire department is in favor of this rule change for flexibility in hiring and also in the selection process. Uh, as has already been mentioned, there's a lot of skills, a lot of attributes uh, in a person that we're looking to hire that we can't necessarily test for using our standardized testing processes. Um, some of the skills that we do look for that we can't test for are soft skills such as communication, 
uh, compassion, a desire, and attitude to carry out our mission, uh, which is uh, serving the city and enhancing uh, the, or serving the community and enhancing the city. And also uh, the ability to adjust to different situations and to think on your feet. Those are things that we can't test in those standardized testing processes. Those are things that we have to actually interview people to really be able to uh, adequately assess. And lastly, um, another consideration of the rule of three when combined with the changes to veterans preference law is that it has greatly affected uh, equity and diversity in our hiring process over the last five to seven years. Um, I don't know if uh, you all are aware of this, but veterans preference points, the rules were changed uh, five to seven years ago. Uh, they went from five points to 10 points for a, uh, for a veteran, and they went from 10 points to 15 points for a disabled veteran. Um, also, there isn't a great deal of diversity in the military here in the Midwest. So when we're drawing on veterans, we're primarily drawing upon uh, white males. And that's what our uh, hiring classes have looked like over the last four to five years. So uh, that is another consideration. Uh, I would just say that uh, in closing, eliminating the rule of three will allow managers and hiring authorities, not just in the fire department, but across the enterprise uh, to interview and consider a larger and more diverse pool of qualified candidates. So that is my presentation on behalf of the fire department. And uh, on behalf of the Minneapolis African-American Professional Firefighters Association, um, I agree with everything I just said. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Chief Tyner. And I will ask, I don't have others who have signed up to speak, but I will ask if anyone else is here. And I'll just, Ms. Sparks, come forward. Go Councilman, ahead and introduce yourself. I'm sorry, yeah, I'm Laura Sparts, and um, I have for 30 years represented two uh, bargaining units in the city of Minneapolis, uh, the Supervisors Association, as well as the Foreman's Association. And I am also the president of the Board of Business Agents. And I am up here ironically, because I don't have any other labor folks here to testify today, and I didn't want the uh, council to believe that this is not a very important issue um, in the broadest sense, in the terms of hiring to all of the labor unions in the city of Minneapolis. Um, it's ironic because I have had for years rule of the list in my collective bargaining agreements, but I also respect my colleagues who have felt in their particular areas um, that the rule of three has been effective. And so I have worked in my capacity as the uh, president to work with city, with the city, to see if there was a way that we could um, acknowledge the individual interests of each bargaining unit because not every job in the city is the same. Um, recognize the will of those who are uh, part of the bargaining unit in terms of their own interests um, as part of a collective bargaining agreement. But we're also concerned about whatever the city council um, adopts for its non-represented employees will be something then that we will see at the bargaining table down the road. And so it's for this reason that we felt it was important to work with the city and uh, see if we could craft something that would make sense for all. We did that in August of uh, uh, 14 actually, had, had come to an agreement with the city with regard to how the special law that moved the city from rule of one to rule of three uh, at the legislature could be amended so that it would, it would uh, embrace the idea of best practices as well as how individual bargaining units would work together. Um, the actual piece of this, which is you're looking at the charter amendment to just simply remove the rule of three. Um, personally, it, it's not a big deal for me, but I know that the concern, and this is the part that I think is important, is we're very concerned about merit. Um, it's one thing to say um, we want to have sound business practices, but I can recall a time, and this would be in the 80s, when sound business practices in the city of Minneapolis meant there were 54 
uh, promotional lines. And that sound practice meant that if you were hired as a secretary in the city of Minneapolis, you could never get promoted outside of any job family that was not related to that secretarial position. So sound principles in and of themselves change over time. And labor is afraid of not what they can see right now, but what they might be able, what might happen down the line. And how do we, how do we participate in that discussion? I really would hope, I, I would have hoped that um, as part of your directions to your staff, that we can keep that concept of merit, not just the sound HR principles, that merit is going to be an, an important aspect of any hiring process. I also request that you adopt the substance of the agreement that we had from that 2014 uh, special law change that we had agreed to. It addresses the issue with how collective bargaining will be treated. There were three parts to that. In your um, current proposal, you're adopting the first two, A and B, with regard to hiring and promotion for the non-rep, non but you are not um, adopting C. And we, labor has an interest in you doing that. Um, we, are, we were also concerned about the ease with which an ordinance could be changed and had requested that could we go to a supermajority. And it's my understanding that because of the process of the um, changing the charter that that isn't something that's possible. But we are concerned about politically motivated changes over time with particular bargaining units if we don't have a strong majority um, in the council. And so I, what I request is that as we look at the this step and then what, what comes after is that you send a loud and clear message that you want to work with labor, that you want HR and labor to continue a partnership that we've had now for a number of years. Because rule of, taking rule of three out of the, out of the uh, charter isn't going to solve your problems. Um, there's a lot of issues that need to be addressed if we're going to achieve real equitable hiring in the city of Minneapolis. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, excuse me. So um, with that, um, I hope that with that offer that as you consider your staff directions for Friday, that you seriously consider where labor is and all this, that we want to continue to partner with you and that you give your staff that direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else who would like to testify as part of this public hearing? Anyone else? And I'll just note that uh, we have uh, Jane Miller here, our superintendent of the park board, who's um, been, uh, of course, following this process as well as Barry Clegg, who is the chair of our charter commission. So I'm not seeing anyone else who uh, wishes to testify. So I will go ahead and close uh, the public hearing. Um, and uh, just a moment here. And I will, uh, for the sake of discussion, I will go ahead and move uh, approval of the proposed charter amendment. I will note for my colleagues that uh, we are uh, a step that will need to happen is uh, working on an ordinance that would essentially uh, replace what were the concepts of the rule of three that were in the city charter. And so we are working to finalize a staff direction and we'll forward that language to colleagues so that you can see that before the meeting on Friday that would um, direct the next steps in uh, putting that together. So um, with that, uh, any discussion on the motion? Councilman? Yes, I did. Uh, I think, didn't I close the public hearing? Yes. Um, Council Member Goodman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I just, I didn't know if there was going to be a fulsome discussion or not. So I just wanted to um, weigh in on the importance of this change in the city charter. Uh, this is something, uh, in my opinion, uh, that has to do directly with the charter as well as the everyday business of the city of Minneapolis. And it will allow us to 
forward our point of view with regard to modern hiring practices and the importance of um, diversity in hiring in the city of Minneapolis. Testing, in my opinion, is such an old school way of thinking about how we hire and to some extent promote employees within the city. Um, testing is one method, but it's not the only method. One method would be how you fit into the group of colleagues you work with or how your um, interaction and action with the public and other uh, coworkers plays out. And I think that's the kind of thing that has to be weighed equally uh, with testing. And um, we know that we really want to have a city workforce going forward uh, that Im incorporates millennials and incorporates the diverse community that we currently operate in and uh, eliminating the rule of three is the only way to hire or promote within our city I don't think makes much sense in this more modern day of employment practices. I do want to note that we have had an unusually long and healthy relationship with our employees and our unions. Uh, in fact, I think in my 18 years here, I can think of only one actual labor stoppage. And we're proud of that relationship with our employees. And so I want to reiterate to organize labor uh, that we want to work with you. We think we'll have more flexibility in working with you as it pertains to ordinance rather than charter. Uh, ordinance is something that we have the ability uh, to make changes on based on the feedback that's given to us where the charter provision is very strictly written. Uh, written. So I do want to note that this is not coming as a result of any kind of conflict uh, within our employee pool or our department heads or people in human resources or those who do hiring and firing, but more coming from a place of thinking about how many of our employees are going to be retiring, how we need to think about the workforce of the future, and all of the things that go into hiring that would give us a more diverse pool moving forward. So I, I, um, I commend the work of Council Member Glidden. This is not kind of the most exciting national policy work going on in the city, uh, but it does achieve our goal of having good relationships with our unions and our employees while also making efforts to advance equity. Council President Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, I'm going to support this um, motion today. Uh, just, uh, uh, I, I appreciate um, Labor's request to uh, be at the table, and it was interesting in um, the meetings that we had with them about, um, that I forget how many bargaining units we have now, 22, is that correct? 24. 24, 22, 24. But uh, the, different, uh, the differences in collective bargaining agreements over the years regarding rule of three or rule of the list or whatever. And um, people have decided, you know, what uh, works best for them. We're at the table on a regular basis with our, our uh, employees in, in uh, collective bargaining. And it is in our interest, I think, as a city to continue that a relationship and and move forward in a way with our ordinance that recognizes the differences between uh, the bargaining units. You know, we have people at very high professional levels. We have technical people. Uh, we have people that have entry level positions in the city, and and um, um, there are different requirements, obviously, for each of these. And and I just think it behooves us to work with our uh, employees. And I'm going to reiterate what Councilmember Goodman said. We have a great relationship. Uh, with labor uh, in our city. Uh, our employees, if you look at our employee survey, people value working in the city of Minneapolis. They feel that their jobs are important to uh, the success of the city and we want to honor that and uh, continue to work with them in all the areas that um, are important for uh, their success as employees and our success as a city because uh, it goes hand in hand. So thank you and I, I look forward to keep, continue working on this. Thank you. I'm not uh, seeing further comments from my colleagues, but I, I want to thank all of the testifiers um, who came forward and also um, both labor and professional staff in the city who have helped uh, educate us about the topic and make sure we're thinking about all uh, of the aspects of um, this issue. Um, I, I agree, rule, rule of three is kind of one of these topics that I will say I've heard about even before I was at the city, but just made my eyes glaze over. It's just one of these complicated topics and it's hard to understand, frankly, how fundamental it is 
to thinking about how uh, employment and hiring works within the city as well as uh, promotional opportunities. Um, I, I just, I will uh, say too that um, there has been discussion for uh, a lot of years about rule of three. And I think part of it is because as a council president referenced, there are a lot of our uh, bargaining units in the city that have chosen to go to something different than the rule of three. I think uh, the vast majority actually of our bargaining units utilize uh, what's called the rule of the list for uh, initial hiring and many as well use that uh, for promotions as well. Um, I personally uh, feel that some of the things that we're hearing from labor are uh, what we need to listen to and do, which is investing further in the human resources enterprise support to make sure we have confidence in our hiring and promotional systems, that they are working the way that we want them to work, that they emphasize uh, support for uh, merit, but also having well-rounded candidates and that there is an opportunity to view uh, a good range of candidates. Um, this is, in my opinion, about moving us into the 21st century. One of the things that was most impactful for me in this was understanding that the rule of three was conceived of before there even was an HR profession. And so we are just, we are in a different place today in how we think about how do you get a best candidate. And whether you talk about educational systems or hiring systems, I think it's rare to find someone who truly believes that a test can determine every best qualification that you want to see. Um, we're about to hear uh, a very major presentation uh, later in this meeting from Human Resources about looking at our workforce as a whole, how are we going to set and meet uh, aggressive uh, goals for uh, uh, people of color represented in our workforce as well as women. And uh, repeal of the rule of three and working on uh, what are the next steps is not a panacea to that, but it is a piece of making sure we have a good system that allows us the best opportunity to reach goals that I will say I think the city as a whole feels are very, very important. So uh, with that and not seeing any further comments, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that item is approved. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have a couple of uh, consent items, and I just want to uh, note uh, that we have a, a few council members who may need to leave the meeting early for another commitment. But uh, uh, so I will just read the consent items, and then we will move to the uh, clerk's presentation on the petition to amend the city charter. Uh, so item number three is uh, referring to staff and ordinance amending Title II, Chapter 17 of the Minneapolis Code of Ordinances relating to administration, finance department, clarifying internal auditor duties and amending the audit committee referral process. So all in approval of that item, uh, discussion on that. Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Next, uh, uh, also on consent, is an item that comes forward uh, once a year. It is a state requirement that we report on certain performance measures. I will say I encourage uh, my colleagues to take a look at the report, which is attached to the agenda. It is, uh, I think, a very interesting compilation of just high-level uh, 10 key performance measures. Um, and. This is approving that resolution declaring the city's commitment uh, to this uh, performance measurement system and completing it. Discussion on that item? Seeing none, all in approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And that item is approved. Now we are to our two discussion items, and the first is uh, from the city clerk's office regarding the vote 15 now Minnesota <coughs> minimum wage increase petition to amend the city charter. Good morning, Madam Vice President and committee members. <clears throat> As indicated, I am here to report on the results of a first review of a petition to amend the city charter that was submitted by the Vote 15 Now Minnesota Committee pursuant to the provisions of Minnesota statutes, section 410.12, subdivision three. And under that enabling statute, a petition to amend a home rule charter must be signed by a number of registered voters equal to at least 5% of the total votes cast in the last general state election. 
The last statewide general election was the 2014 gubernatorial election, in which a total of 137,362 ballots were cast in Minneapolis. Based on that total, any such petition must include the signatures of at least 6,869 registered Minneapolis voters to be deemed sufficient under the statute. This particular petition was submitted by the Vote 15 Now Minnesota Committee through its chair, Ginger Jensen, who is with us today. The petition seeks to submit to the electorate a ballot question that, if adopted, would establish within the charter a citywide minimum wage of $15 per hour. The petition was formally presented to the Charter Commission at its July 13 meeting. I will also note that the Charter Commission Chair, Barry Clegg, is with us. The petition was transmitted by the Charter Commission to the city for validation on July 14. Under the statute, the city must complete its examination of the petition within 10 days after it has been received from the Charter Commission. When the 10-day review period ends, the clerk must either certify that the petition sufficiently meets statutory requirements or that it is insufficient and does not meet statutory requirements. Although the 10-day review period doesn't end until next Monday, staff has completed its first review of this petition and we are therefore uh, ready this morning to report on the results of that review. I'd like to take a moment to recognize and thank the team that worked diligently to review and verify this petition. Uh, this petition encompassed 17,902 separate signatures spread across 2,068 individual pages. The processing team was once again ably led by Assistant City Clerk Christian Rummelhoff and James Hovey from our Elections and Voter Services Division. The processing team included the following members, Aaron Roundtree, Alex Bentred, Amy Anderson, Anissa Ali, Bruce Norgard, Daniel Dawson, Eric Shirley, Grant Johnson, Greg Munson, Jaffer Saeed, Joanna Lund, John Martin, Julie Sell, Kitra Katz, Lucy Shong, Maddie Norgard, Marina Campbell Vargas, Samantha Grack, and Sang Nguyen. Many of these team members were also involved in the review of the petition that had been submitted previously by the Committee for Professional Policing, so that their experience helped to expedite the timely review of this petition. I would also like to thank our IT department and specifically James Blake and Stacy Blaskowski for consulting with us on how to optimize our search processes. As before, the processing team performed multiple checks of the petition to carefully assess each signature against the roles of registered voters provided to us by the Office of the Secretary of State. And as I stated, to be deemed a valid petition under the enabling statute, a petition must include the signatures of at least 6,869 registered Minneapolis voters, the equivalent of 5% of the total ballots cast in the last statewide general election. As noted, this petition encompasses a total of 17,902 signatures, and of these, staff was able to verify a total of 8,418, which satisfies the statutory minimum required to be deemed a valid petition. Thus, having completed the statutory evaluation of this petition, I am reporting to Council that this petition submitted by Vote 15 Now Minnesota is deemed sufficient in meeting the statutory requirements, and I am therefore certifying it as a valid petition. Having been certified as a valid petition, it's now the duty of the City Council to take up the matter and, assuming that it is a proper subject for a home rule charter, to determine the language of the ballot question to be submitted to the electorate. Staff has queued up a referral to the Committee of the Whole for its next regular meeting on August 3, at which time those issues would be decided in a formal recommendation packaged for referral back to the full City Council for its consideration and action. Madam Vice President, I know there is uh, still one more important item on your agenda, as you mentioned, so in consideration of the committee's time, I won't go into specific findings from the staff's report, but would point out that the report does include a line-by-line -line analysis of the petition, along with a copy of the supervisor's log notes that reflect the processing team's daily activities. Staff has prepared a full copy of the marked petition with this line-by-line -line analysis to give to the petitioning group. The original petition is filed in the clerk's office and available for public access and review. With that, I've concluded my report and I'm happy to stand for any questions the committee might have. Thank you, Mr. Carl. And I'll just uh, say again, um, so this is now the second petition that we have uh, received at the city um, in uh, this election uh, cycle and uh, seeing the work that your team has done to uh, verify uh, the signatures and uh, make sure there is a transparent report of, of your findings, uh, detail by detail. There's a huge book that's been passed down on this. I just think is very impressive work and thank you and your team for all the work there. Um, our actions here are uh, 
one, to receive and file this report. So this is just a reporting requirement. This is the duty of the clerk and the reports to the city council. So we'll receive this report. My intention as well is there is a staff direction that puts in place some next steps uh, to ensure that the city council is prepared to consider uh, these petitions and next matters at its next committee of the whole. And there are copies of that staff direction over by the, the clerk and they have been passed out to my colleagues. Um, so I think seeing no questions right now, informational questions, I will go ahead and receive and file and then I'll read the staff directive and see if there are questions from colleagues and then we'll vote on that. So uh, re uh, motion to receive and file on approval, please say aye. 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 Opposed. Uh, next, we have a staff directive, and there are two points to this uh, staff directive, uh, which is regarding the petition, both the petition for police liability insurance, which is also in the process of uh, being before this 